any story you have heard of Skid Row will never live up to what I have seen. Because we can tell you a thousand times or a million times. And you can get guys from all over the city to tell you these stories. But unless you were there to see this, you would never believe the graphics of it. It was treacherous. And Skid Row was one of the most dangerous places I had ever been in my life. Skid Row was built on a history of violence and dangerous people, which they called the bloodbath. When the bloodbath first started, most people think it was 68, when Tukey became the founder of the Crips, when he invented the Crips, because they say the Bloods was here first. And the bloodbath was dangerous, but it was a lot before that. In 64, 62, uh, downtown Skid Row, before that name was Los Angeles, was one of the most dangerous sites ever around. And I had been a lot of places. I had been to Chicago, Capita Green, Houston, you know, but none was never more dangerous than L.A. because of the fact that uh, there was a lot of money in Los Angeles. And, 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 and it was so dangerous till when the reputation of Skid Row got out, you had some of the baddest guys, some of the most, I, mean, I won't say baddest or tough or anything, but just guys that what didn't have no fear. It was something like John Clark Van Damme, the blood sport, where these guys would come in from other cities to come in Skid Row. It was a playground for the baddest of the baddest and the most, and the ones, and intimidated of the intimidators. You know, whoever could intimidate the other one the most would take over Skid Row. But the bloodbath was considered a major killing. Now, when the killing first started, it was a Crip, Blood, and a few Mexican gangs like the Montevilles and the Mexican uh, Mafia, White Fence, Bad Boys, 18th Street. Those were vicious killers, and they were. Uh, like my homeboy kicked, he got killed, and Jack Lucas blowed his head up like a scan of spray paint. It, it was like something you saw in a movie, you know? And then they, 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 the Jamaican, they ran and shot him up, and it was something like, and Jack Lickers on fifth and uh, right off, right between fifth and Crocker, on fifth between Crocker and San Pedro. But they done closed Jack Lickers down now, because so much killing was going on. But they killed the Jamaican, they blew half his, messed his body up so bad when they shot him, they shot him up that morning. Uh, and so uh, when these guys, the Crips in the, and the Bloods and the Mexican gangs were killing each other. It was pretty vicious then, drive by shooting them. But it didn't really get vicious until you got the outsiders coming in, which was your solo killers. They wasn't going to be in a gang. And these were consist of all races, mostly whites, because they wanted to come down here and buy their hair when they crystal and stuff like that. And these guys thought some of these guys were punks. But people, these guys, they weren't in the Hell's Angel, they were Hell's Angel type guys. And when they came down here, you talking about the bloodbath, some of these white boys would, would, would fuck, would mess these brothers up. And they didn't think, they didn't know what they was dealing with. Cause you had these savage ass killers that come out of Oklahoma, come out of Texas, uh, Chicago. And it was something like, uh, it was something like a like a first blood thing. If you saw that movie, The First Blood, when that man, when he went through that town, that shit, tore that whole town up. It was something like that when these white boys came in the Skid Row. They would come in here and you didn't know him, and these guys would slap, try to slap him upside the head, or slap him upside the head, and that would be his one and only slap, because these guys would get up with machetes or. And, they, and some of them knew special skills, and they would cut half your body off. So I seen a dude take a dude, a white boy take his teeth and bite in the side of a black man's jaw and held it so tight he couldn't move. And the dude was trying to, but every time he tried to raise his hand to scream, he would bite harder, had him sticking on his toes and bit, and bit a chunk out of his jaw and spit on him. When the dude fell to the floor and grabbed his face, he thought it was over. It wasn't. He should have never messed that dude because that white boy fucked around and killed him right there just to let him know that you don't mess with people you don't know nothing about. Like one of my buddies told me one time it was a Mexican with tattoos on him all across his body. And he said, uh, he came to me, stranger. He knew I get it a little bit, so he said, help me. He said, come on, back me up on this dude. 
And I saw this big Mexican. Now, you know, I ain't with size just came. I had been in three or four Mexican penitentiaries, so size didn't really scare me. It was way to outthink size if you if you had to. But what really bothered me is that I asked him when I said, yeah, we're going to beat this motherfucker all the way back to Mexico to the desert bowl. And I put my boots on and got ready when I said, what did he do to us? And do we know this guy? We never met this guy before. And I said I wouldn't have nothing to do with it because I didn't know the guy. So he went and got another one of my homeboys. <laughs> they, they went after this Spanish dude, and uh, this dude tore them apart. And I asked him, I say, and I say, he didn't kill him, but he tore him apart. And I asked him, I say, did you look at the tattoo? Some people had their tattoos so long they made mistakes when they were young. But they, they didn't care about this. They only wanted to be the king of Skid Row. And I told them then, you cannot have one king of all the Skid Row. And so when these bad guys came into Skid Row, like at the hotel, the L. Ray, when they came into this in, in the Skid Row thinking they were going to be the, they won a couple of fights or they might fuck the dude up. Uh, 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 pretty bad, but eventually, no matter how bad as you was, you gotta remember, you got these guys coming from all across the world. Chicago, because they done heard of this, this Skid Row. And it was a lot of money in Skid Row. And everybody was on the take back then. The reason it was so treacherous, so dangerous, because even the police was on the take. They were paying police officers off, and they were blind out of these murders. And, and we were making so much, we ride around our trunk with four and five keys of motherfucking cocaine in our trunk of our car. I had a, I had a friend named B-Roll. I won't call his whole name, but his name was B-Roll. He pulled up to the park in front of Julian one day, and the police pulled in right behind him. They, we were paying them off, but they didn't like this guy because he wouldn't pay them. And they pulled up behind him, opened his trunk, and found 75 pounds of weed in the trunk of his car. That's how open the freelance was in Skid Row. And that's what brought these guys here for all that money. But once they got here, you had one guy named Hoover Jack walk around, hit your pockets like this. See if you got any money, rob you right there on the stack, on the, on, on the spot. He killed the girl, they say, because, because he, I mean, they, he killed the girl because she gave him AIDS, HIV. But now, this female did not let make him have sex with her. Yeah, sex with her you want. And that's what it was back then, because these dudes would get drugs and want to have sex with all these different females. But you know what Skid Row was that dangerous and they had that much violence that it was a lot of disease and a lot of sex happening and rapes down here at night for the females that tried to hang up here. Which brings me to another point. The females is one of some of the toughest mothers around here. Because once you started raping them and beating them up, them girls would carry blades in their purse and everything, and they would con you and smile, cut your throat, cut your meat off. Sometimes they would go on the corner and, 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 and know you're going to look at their butt, put booty shorts on and stuff, and get your, and then, they say, and then you would try to walk up to them and talk and get a date, and they knew you was one of them asshole, vicious motherfuckers that done them. And they, oh, yeah, baby, I'll give you a couple rocks. But these girls had them been lied to and beat on and played on and all this here. So they would say, okay, yeah, I'll get out with you and con you down the street in the dark. And then once you got down that street, four, five more girls were walking behind that car with clubs and knives and shit. And you might hit one in the face, but are you going to hit that one behind you, beating you in the head with that club? How much, how long can you take that many licks in the back of your head, that thing? Are you going to get the one that's on the side of you study hitting you with a knife in your arm and on your side? And what about the girl that's at your feet study beating your shin bone and your kneecaps because they're hitting all the points to take you down? And once you fall to the ground, if you fail, it was truly over then because they piled around you like a bunch of hyenas and would have no mercy. Kill you dead right there in the dark. Like my homeboy caveman up here on... Uh, on uh, 7th in uh, San Pedro. Con this girl, man, all day long and had an intent, I'm going to give you this. He was a big dealer and all that so much. And he, uh, he conned this girl in the tent and, 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 and did all kinds of fine things with her and gave her a nipple or a damn rock after all that sex. And he thought and laughed at it and thought it was slick, like she couldn't do nothing, and went to his tent and went to sleep in a tent. 
Not a house with bars on it and a key to the door, but he went to a little flimsy ass tent and went to sleep on this guy after doing it like that. The girl had an aluminum bat with spikes stuck all over the bat and walked in his tent while he was asleep and started whooping him with them spikes in that aluminum bat till he was dead and they found him in his tent dead. The guy down here, I'm gonna get his name. He lived off of seventh between Crocker and 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 and, and uh Crocker and uh Gladys. He would he was a speed freak, but they say speed made the girls horny. Okay, it might you might do a little bit of speed, it might give you a little anxiety for an hour or two, maybe two or three hours. But that don't mean you want to go on a tent and sit there and, and you love Chris so much that you're going to go on a tent and stay in there for two or three days doing nothing but sucking meat and getting hit in the butt and coochie all and the man won't let you out. He would lock his tent and wouldn't let the girls out. But he did it to the wrong girl because one girl he got had family and she went and told somebody and they found him in the tent. Look at the picture on there. They found him in his tent in a chair like this here with his throat cut, head back. Just like that. That's how he was found in his tent. Because he would take these girls in his tent and lock the tent up. And when they started doing crystal with them, he would rape these girls and make them stay there. Like they lay crib, because he gets so horny on the crisp, he want to have sex three or four days and all day. And you know how well, you think your person putting their shit in your mouth or your body all day make you sick till you want to throw them, you won't let them out. And you're sick and you're looking at this man do this to you. But when she finally got out, he met he went home to his maker. Because whoever her family was, they was not going to tolerate. And do you know he had a family member come up? And one dude, I was walking by his tent one day and I said, and I didn't make that. I, I, I seen a black guy standing out there. I didn't know him, but I, he was looking at the tent. I said, yeah, that's a sad thing, man. People live and come and die in Skid Row all the time. I've been there for many years. The dude looked at me and said, well, what happened? Do you know what happened? I said, yeah, drugs happened. Just like that. And walked away. Because I, I mean, even though I don't approve of death, and I didn't want this guy to die, I wasn't going to sit there and feel sorry for this man at the same time because he brought that on himself, keeping them girls in them tents, taking what, taking what he wanted to take. So I, didn't, I wasn't happy about his death, but I just said drugs happen and walk away because I don't want this guy feeling sorry for your brother. I know you miss your cousin or brother, whoever he is. I'm thinking in my mind, but you should have told him that before he took all them girls in the tent and locked, put the lock on the tent and kept them in there raping them. Just like you love your family member, somebody gonna love their family member. So, and, uh, and so when all these bad guys came from all over Chicago, which you will know had a bad ass reputation, come up in LA, Skid Row, New York, Philadelphia, uh, Detroit, which is another, another treacherous place, came up in the Skid Row. And then from the cities around LA, you had bad names, big names around in the city like Big Skillet who's now in prison for uh, uh, Hoover Jack, Big Bunchy from Insane, Young Scotty from uh, Lil Johnny from Hoover. All these were some of the most vicious names and you couldn't show no fear in Skid Row. Even if you knew you was finna get in a fight and die, both of y'all had guns and knives, you had to come in Skid Row and smile because you had to live up to that reputation of being mad. And people would look at me like they called me stranger. At the time, I swear to God, when we, I come downtown, they say, they would look at me and say, oh, that's a stranger. He was born over there on Maple. They say, uh, they say, uh, they would say, he out of Hollywood, he do Hollywood. And they would look at other people and say, that's Big Skillet from, from Grape. That's Bunchies from Insane. That's Hoover Jack from Hoover. That's Lil Johnny from Hoover. That's Scarface from East Coast. And all these names, when they heard this, would get jealous and envy each other. And the Mexicans wanted to make their mark. The Mexican Mafia. They didn't have all these colorful, they had colorful nicknames, but not as out there like we did, you know? And so uh, when, they, when they got into the picture, it, it exploded a little bit more. Because we're just twin brothers, Crips and Blood. So the Mexicans, Montevillas, White Fence, Bad Boys, 18th Street, all of them hated each other. 
They was killing each other. Brothers was killing each other. Mexican Mafia was killing each other. Everybody was killing. At one point, do you know I seen on the corner where they had Crips, Bloods, and Mexicans shooting like this here. Bye, bye. All of them was on a different corner. The police showed up and could not get order with voice, with mouth. So they get, they start breaking out their shit. Bam, bam. So you got four people on four different corners shooting at each other. But now the other three had to back down because when the police couldn't get it under control with them little glocks, you know the heavy equipment came in there. And so when they came in there with, they, with the big guns, the little guns had to take off and run. You know, and it was so it was so much shooting that it was so smoky out there that you it was like the Fourth of July. You thought you would saw firecrackers and cherry bombs. That's how much the shooting was back then. But then there, Skid Row was wide open territory. So you got to remember, there is no order. Like that, like that man said in K and and, and uh and uh blown away. Tommy Lee Jones and Jeff Bridges. I have come to start a new government called Anarchy. A new order called chaos. That's what it was in Skid Row, anarchy and chaos. And the police couldn't get no order, but when it started branching out, when these white boys started coming into Hollywood, the body was taking it back to Hollywood, and this bloodbath started, and they started defending themselves, some of the people would leave here to go get the white boys. But when they got over there, they wasn't just getting white boys, because you got to remember, you now into the territory of the skinheads and the hell angels. So now when you're in Hollywood, you're into their area. The Hells Angels been here forever. You know that. And they are, they are prepared to die and kill. They were, they, 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 their legend is born, is based on killing and not, and, being, and not being afraid of death. And then you got the Nazi guys with the Nazi tricks with the skinheads up in Hollywood too. Them, they warned against the Hells Angels, but then when these brothers go up in there, they will see. They look like like it's a, it's a surprise, surprise. The these some of these guys had special skills. They went martial art classes. Some of them would carry chains, and they were rough. Tattoos, scars all across their face, rough looking, and they were nasty and mean, and wasn't scared to die. I seen a dude coughing up blood one time on the ground, and he was laughing while he was dying. Yeah. Right there on Lost Town, he's sitting there on the sidewalk, and his buddy, <laughs> and he calls me and say, I'll see you when you get there, Papa. When I looked at this white boy do that, I thought, this man dying and coughing up blood out of his mouth, and he's smiling and telling his home, well, I'll see you when you get there, which means heaven or hell, if they do exist, he was telling his home, well, I'll see you when you get there. And he wasn't scared to die. So when these guys, the guys up today, this wearing these, wearing these shades and coming up in these jags and acting like they tough, that time is gone. Yeah, you might have a little isolated incident here and there where guys, you know, but it ain't nothing like it was back then. Drive by you every hour from the morning to night. Da 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 all day long, all day, every day. Every day in schedule at least, I say, from seven to 10 murders around the city of Los Angeles. I won't say it's just between Hollywood and here, every day, mostly all day long, all week. In a week, you'd have about 15, 20 murders, 30 murders. And that's, 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 that's the history of Skid Row. And these guys ride up talking about they came, they might have came up in a poverty hard time, but you know, uh, we might have came up, uh, our parents didn't have a lot of money or something like that, or you had no parents, or you know, you might have been abused a little bit about your mother and father, or you it might have been molested. But it was nothing like coming out here in Skid Row. How you gonna have nine got 30 guys on the corner drinking and doing drugs, and all 30 of them got a gun or a knife in their waistband? Big blade. You, 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 it's an invitation for death. All y'all drinking, and we all got guns? I got stabbed right here in Hollywood by a white boy named Dutch. We was fighting over, over, a, white, over a girl, a white girl named Lorraine, who was carrying my baby. I never had children after that. Dutch 
and them caught my girl one night and held her down and beat her stomach to make sure that baby didn't come to the world. So we had been looking for each other. Uh, I don't guess he was looking for me, but he wasn't going to run from me. I was looking for him because of my baby and caught him in front of a place called Shakey's Pizza. He had five or six of his homeboys with him. I had five or six of my homeboys with me. And I told him, let's do it mano to mano. You know, kill each other hand by hand. Be one of his death. So he agreed with that, but then he had a screwdriver in his hand. My buddy told me, he said, he got a screwdriver. When he said that, another one of his homeboys came out forward and then my homeboy, before you know all this, he hit me in the struggle with a screwdriver. And my screwdriver was stuck in my chest because if I'd have pulled it out, the blood would have been, would have been, would have been, would have been thrown. I could have lost a lot of blood. So I kept the screwdriver in there like this here and kept fighting him. Right? So the police was all out there. They might call the police. And I think we blacking each other's eyes a little bit and wanted to do more. And my blood and my, I got the worst in the deal because the screwdriver was still in my chest. And when the police got there, uh, the screwdriver was in my chest. He grabbed the inner and shook it like that. And he said, did that hurt? I said, ah, that hurt. Like that there. And uh, he said, I said, I'm leaving, man. He said, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> like that there. And he said, you're not going nowhere. I went to walk away to pull each other. Man, I say you ain't going nowhere but the jail if you don't sit your ass down. You're not going nowhere. He's called the ambulance for you. And you got to tell us what happened. He said, you going to talk to us. And I say, no, I'm not. Like that there, because we, 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 you couldn't be no snitch, you know? You go to the county jail. And so uh, they called the ambulance. They took me to the hospital, removed the screwdriver out lightly, or they cut it around or something. However they got it, I forget. They removed the screwdriver lightly. Well, it would be a little painful, but it wouldn't be as much pain. Well, and speaking of the county jail, now these skid row was bad, but when you went to the jailhouse for being busted for murder, it even got worse because the county jail was so full. The old county, they were putting five and six and seven guys in those tanks. And if you was not worthy of being in that tank, they were going to try you as soon as you walked into that. This is the county. This ain't even a prison. When you walked in that cell, if you wasn't worthy of eating, you did not eat. We took your food. If you wasn't worthy of keeping people up off, off, off of you like a female, they took your butt. They took, and, and this cell is very small. So six or seven people in there, when you fighting one, others watching, <coughs> ain't no deputy around. They wearing out the other end. So you can haul a deputy and all that. Ain't nobody going to hear you. So when you fighting this guy in this cell, if you got tired, they fucked you. If you lost, they fucked you. Ain't nobody to break up the fight. The deputy ain't coming down here. And if you try to back off and say, I don't want no more, then you got time for you to be a girl or keep fighting. They're going to beat you, they're going to beat you to death in that cell unless you, if you don't fight, you're going to have sex. And even before that, when you, after that, when you went to prison, these gang bangers that came up in Skid Row, they put all the bangers on one yard because they couldn't have, the prison was only so big. So now you got the mother bills the Bloods and the Crips, and the prison on the same yard. The same people that saw each other in Skid Row was trying to kill each other. Now they on the yard killing until they had to bring that down until the federal government went in there and say it won't be no more of this. You got too many deaths in this prison. And they started separating the Bloods and the Crips. They had to separate them and the Mexican gangs, some of them, because they was killing in and all over. The prisons were more, more deadlier than the street because over, once these guys got life, I knew they wasn't never giving out no more. They didn't give a damn unless they got the death penalty. And when you kill somebody in there, <laughs> if you didn't get the death penalty, they, they look at you when you went to court and say, what, you going to give me another life sentence and laugh? And sometimes the judge would call them by surprise when they laugh and say, no, we gave you three life sentences already. But what are you going to do to me now? We're going to send you to the death penalty and kill you out alone. And then only then when his face gets serious. Oh, you're going to put me on death row now? Of course. You done done this and you keep talking crazy to us and you done got three life sentences. I had a lamb boy named Harry Larry Kimball. We walked in the county jail. He asked me to do a burglary one night and I wouldn't go with him. 
He went to do the burglary. So I didn't. I, I wake up the next morning, call his house, to get in touch with. I got it to get in touch with him. His sister answered the phone. I say, "Where Larry at?" Let me holler at Larry. He said, "Who?" I say, "This at this time, this was another nickname. He called me Little D. My name was Little D at that time. Was real short and small, but real stocky and big in the shoulders. Uh, uh, and so they say, I say, it's Little D. Well, Larry, let me holler at Larry. She say, Larry ain't here. I say, what, he been out all night? He say, no, you ain't heard. I say, heard what? He say, Larry got busted and went to the county jail last night. And that's when I thought about the burglar. I say, God damn it, he did that. I said, okay, all right, I'll be, I'll be in touch with you soon. And so uh, I hung the phone up. They had me, and at this time, all of us was getting big time. Larry, Frankie Jones, Michael Mack, and me. Yeah, Larry, Frankie Jones, Michael Mack, and me. When Larry go to trial, he come back crying. He say, man, these people gave me 154 years. 154 years for a burglary? He said, yeah, because I wouldn't take the 10. I went to trial, they gave me 154 years. So he say, uh, we say, all of us, when Larry started crying, <laughs> All of us sit on the bunk and start crying. <laughs> we ain't getting out no more. Because we had cases better than burglary. <laughs> I was in there for a manslaughter. Motherfucking Frankie Jones was in there for a double, a, uh, triple robberies. And Michael Mack was in there. I think he was in there on a manslaughter or murder or something, too. I, if I remember right, all of us know we got them big cases. This man had a burglary and got 100. So we all sit on the bunk and start crying. We say, shit. And every one of us got time. Unfortunately, Frankie Jones, he died in there. He got in the fight and got stuck in there. From here, from what I know of Michael Mack, he's still there to this day. He's been there about 40 years, 50 years. Uh, I got out after 22 years. And so uh, from what I know about Larry, well, I haven't heard nothing in years once I left the prison. But as far as I know, with the 154, he's still placed there too. Who was Jack Skilly? All them still there. So when people come in the skid row, and you can never, we can tell it however we want to tell it, you will never get the graphics of it unless you were there to see this. Because this was something that was so treacherous and nasty, the way they would kill these people. I seen dudes get, get hit on their collarbone with a machete, and it'd go right into their meat, and like it's something you would see in a movie or something. You know, and then it would do pull up and try to get ready and keep hitting him in the face and head and everything. And uh, the police, uh, two, uh, five or six police got killed. One time they was chasing the guy from the L.A. Mission, and this is when the Los Angeles Mission was supposedly being built. The police turned the corner, chasing somebody, and ran to this big, huge hole in the middle of this ditch and killed them both. One, per, one of them got killed behind the L.A. Mission many years ago. The other one got killed down off of Los Angeles somewhere right beyond the Misery House. There was a police officer. They caught, they caught him back there and shot him up because he, he was such a vicious man. And I remember the police were gangbangers too. Even though they were the police, the guys they were hiring to come up in Skid Row were these guys with Marines and killed you big old... They, uh, they come out of Marine Corps, country boys out of the woods, carry big old tobacco in the side of them out, spit tattoos all up and down their arms, badasses, real badasses, you know? And these motherfuckers come out there, and the folk like Cap Meats would look at me, he say, uh, he look at me, he say, uh, you again, huh, stranger? He say, <laughs> he spit that tobacco, take him on to the county jail. And that's how deep his voice was. He said, we'll deal with him later. This is not over. Let's go. And they would take one you and take me to county jail and walk deep in the skid road and cock them little riot pumps and shit and say, <laughs> uh, and my own blood's from a well on a building. I hear my street, don't come here, copper, we'll kill you. Police hollered back, we didn't come to live. <laughs> we came to die. And before you know it, that chopper be coming up from behind on the other side like this here with that motherfucking long-ass gun to sit out the side. 
bullets that long hit your body and knock half of it off, like you something in Beirut or something. They have bullets that long, knock half your body off. And they wouldn't shoot the kill at first. They shoot you and knock half your cut, take one of your legs from you, feel that pain. Bust you in the shoulder and take half of your body from you and feel the pain. And, and then look at you and say, you want to quit now? Or do we keep fine? Do we, have you had enough? Like that there. And they would bring some of the guns we had never seen in our life in this bloodbath. And then the federal government took over and declared war on Skid Row. There will be no more baby raping. There will be no more kids getting raped, no more killing every day, killing police officers and all that. And, and so the history of Skid Row, remember, was a playground for the, I say it again, for the baddest of the baddest. And people from all over the United States, this is LA, from all over the United States would come with them, with them big names, them badass names to come up in Skid Row and prove themselves. Now, some of them died, didn't die and went to prison for the rest of their life. And so a lot of them died because you can't win them all. Now, how bad you, no matter how bad you are, somebody, you got another one the next day. Somebody want to take that reputation. You know, they want, they want to be the king of Skid Row. So even if you didn't lose your life, one way or another, you lost it because you wasn't going to be here. You was either in prison for life for being such a badass, killing so many people, or you died. And the drugs was commendable. And it was like something like out of Spider-Man book, The Kingpin. Everybody wanted to be the Kingpin. And the GR office, the General Relief office, almost forgot, was the most dangerous place you could go. Because now they give you food stamps and money. But if you went to the GR office back then, this is where all the gangbangers hung at. Because as soon as you got your food stamps, if you was a nothing person, no gang or nothing, they took those food stamps all your money. They took that GR check or your voucher, because back then they used to get vouchers for a motel. You can go, you they would give you a voucher to go in a motel and stay for a week and give you voucher, eat at some of the finest restaurants all around the city. And you would get store bought, I mean restaurant service like you were paying for it on these vouchers. But then people when they see you with these vouchers, they would ask, can they come to your room and sleep tonight? Or can they, can you have, can they have some of your food? If you didn't give it, they took it. They were forced their way in your room. You know, I'm staying here. You take your whole voucher and give it to the hotel manager and say, it's my voucher. And take your room. It's like that there. They take your room and your food. And if you couldn't get high back then, because as soon as you took a hit, if you sat down and take a hit, somebody would come across you when they know you get spooked on the crack, they come across you as hard as they could with their fists or a pipe, and bam! Knock your brain, try to knock your brains out. Or you, when you seen them walk up on you, you get spooked. You sitting there hitting, and they be scared. They reach down and grab it, what they want it from you, because they know you were scared and couldn't move. If you said something or try to stop them, that's when they knock your brains out. But if they thought they could scare you, and you wouldn't move, you was high, and you'd be looking, they just reach down and grab your shit and turn and walk away and leave you there. So my point was this, any story you have heard of Skid Row will never live up to what I have seen. Because we can tell you a thousand times or a million times, and you can get guys from all over the city to tell you these stories, but unless you were there to see this, you would never believe the graphics of it. It was treacherous. And Skid Row was one of the most dangerous places I had ever been in my life. And when I say that, you got to remember, anybody that been to Houston back in the 70s, uh, 70s or the 80s, they had a theater called the Majestic Theater downtown where they were killing like a mob mother in Houston, Texas. But it was never tough as L.A. And, and Louisiana, that was, where they came, that was one of the murder couples of the, of the United States. But it was never tough as Skid Row. And I was in jail in Louisiana, House of D, where they did some of the same type of thing they did in L.A. You had to fight for your food. But it, I, was in, I, I, went through, I went through Capita Green in Chicago, just a youngster. Tyler, I was probably about 10, 15 years old then, or some, somewhere between 10 and 15, and it was dangerous. But I had never seen nothing like I seen in Skid Row. These guys had AK-47s, Uzis, and they were standing in the middle of the street and do their business right there. Broad daylight, night, day, it didn't matter. 
you know? And the police, they wasn't on the take, with, 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 they would with, try to take them down. And some of them would get took down, but like I say, then they would bring it up. And the ones that was on the tape would turn their blind eye to it. It was like bad, bad Leroy Brown. Some of the toughest of the tough died. Got beat down, got fucked up. And they won a few when they came up in here. But then none of them last very long. Because all of a sudden, every time you get in a fight, you make a mistake. Look somewhere else. Forget to do something. And once you look somewhere else and forget to do that, the person you fighting against capitalizes on the opportunity to hit you across the face with a knife, stab you, or shoot you down or something. You know? And so, yeah, Skid Row was, it was very, one of the best. That's what I had to say, man. That these guys are coming up telling you today they wasn't there. And to know this, to know, someone to have seen this, they'd have to be in their 60s. Maybe they very, very late 50s, older. And, the gang, and then another thing, see, the young gangbangers coming up today, when they tell you they're in a gang member, got to be in a gang, no, they don't. They sag, but do you know 10 years, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you got caught with your pants hanging down below your waistline, the, any gangbanger would say, what hood you from? If you wasn't from a neighborhood and, and, you, jump, and you jump claim a neighborhood, that the, they would contact somebody from that neighborhood and they say they didn't know you, they would beat your ass and make you pull your pants up. Because it was something like the Marine Corps. You had to be worthy to be in a game, which means you had to be jumped in. They don't know if you're going to turn on them, they get in a fight and they get about to die, you're going to turn and run and snitch on them or what. So they made you prove yourself worthy of being in this game. So these guys today, this sagging, don't have no challenge. There ain't no more jumping in. They just wake up one day and just start sagging and say, I'm a gangbanger. Ain't nobody at their door forcing them to be no ganger no more. In the, in the, back then, in the neighborhood, you had to be a gangbanger because these dudes would show up at your door, force you to be in a gang, make you be in a gang, get tattoos. And if you didn't, they'd shoot your house up at night, drive by and shoot your house up at night, or mess with the women folks in your house or the kids. So yes, you had to be a banger there. I come up in that neighborhood, and I, you know, I found that saw my brother and they made me be a banger. I had to be a banger, save my life, save my family. Because if you wasn't a banger, these guys came at you, tear your house up, put pressure on you till you became a banger for their protection. But how well could they protect you? Because they were still drive-bys every day. You hit me, I'm going to do your neighborhood. You do mine, I'm going to do your neighborhood. And they would ride by shooting each other in the neighborhood, killing sometimes innocent people, kids and women standing on bus stops and stuff like that. It was dangerous. So there you have it, people. Skid Row is a danger, was, was and is, a, and, and still can be in many ways a dangerous, dangerous place. But Skid Row was the playground of the baddest of the baddest. And, and, and they came from miles around to earn their, earn, earn their name and, and, and earn their reputation. A lot of them died to do that. This is nothing compared to the things I have seen in my life, you know? And so uh, all it was about was people just running around being wild, stupid, and crazy. And let me say this here. Even though we had to look brave, or act brave, <laughs> and smile, because we thought we were the baddest of the baddest, we all of us were scared inside. We were scared to death that we had won the fight the day before and would lose this one today. And even if we didn't get in the fight the very next day, we all looked at each other when one of us got killed or died and said, how long will I make it? I mean, when is my turn coming to die? Because you knew you had a turn coming. As you see all your homeboy, your friends go out like that. You just wonder when your turn was come. But you do, everybody has one coming. So I'm just saying, you badass motherfucker out there, <laughs> it's another one you're going to run into eventually. Have a good day. That's Skid Row Stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what really happened. That's the truth.